And we're live. Amazing. <laughs> so cool to see all of you here. Wow. So this class was supposed to happen this morning at Barcelona Academy of Arts. But as you might have heard, there's this virus going around. And I'm trying to do an experiment and do the class here. One second. There, I was hearing echo. So this is the first time I'm doing this. It's gonna be a little bit bumpy, but I hope you're gonna learn some stuff about color. Um, yeah, I think most of you, probably 99% of you are artists who paint and color is an amazing tool of communication for us. And there's some things I learned when I studied back in Florence that are really helpful for navigating color and making color decisions. You can see the, well, there's things that I learned there in Florence and then of course, since then. And this class is kind of a summary of all the stuff that I've learned. I will try to demo and I left my tablet over there. So I'll get it in a moment. Um, and there will be some suggestions for exercises for you guys to do. So give me one moment. Sorry. <laughs> By the way, how is the audio and the connection? I don't have the fastest internet here where I am. I'm not sure if it's going to work. I did a test and it seemed okay, but let me know. There's one question, how many people there here? We have 80 people, 81. So that's about the same <laughs> as in the class at the academy right now, which is just one of my favorite times of the week to do that class. So I'm ready. Pretty good so far. Cool. All right, let's switch to this color. And let me connect this little thingy here. <laughs> I hope this will get a lot smoother, more professional, but hey, I'm trying my best. So I hope it will be okay. So this is one of the paintings I did as a student. And of course it's about proportions and transitions and all of that. But the biggest thing here was color. It's a master copy of one of Vermeer's paintings and color, not just in, oh, it's a yellow top, but exactly what kind of yellow. Where's my mouse? Huh, interesting. Okay, there. So what kind of yellow? There are brighter yellows, darker yellows, grayer yellows, redder yellows. How do you make all those decisions of what color to find? That's what we'll talk about. Here's another painting. I did a still life from life. Color is fascinating. It's really complex and that makes it interesting because you can dive really deep into it. And for a lot of people, I think it's intimidating and it doesn't have to be, especially when you're drawing from life, because with three simple ideas, you can find any color that you can see. And those three simple ideas are the same in traditional paint where you're mixing pigments or digitally when you're picking colors from a color picker like this in Photoshop, for example. Trick that I use or the method I use, the framework I use when I work with color is the Munsell system. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but even if you're not familiar, you probably have heard the terms hue, value, and chroma. If not chroma, then maybe saturation, 
which is a synonym. And I'll explain each of these three dimensions of color. And they're really, the word dimension is appropriate because you can think of color as a color space, which has three dimensions. So you can navigate around that space. That's what this system allows you to do. So hue is what people usually refer to when they say color. It's green, yellow, blue, all these different hues. And if you look at the model on the right, the hue goes around the space. Value, the second dimension of color, is just the brightness from very bright to very dark, the amount of light or the absence of light. And on the 3D model of the color space, that's going up and down. So more light, you go higher up in the 3D space, less light, you go down. And the last one, chroma or saturation, some people also think of it as intensity. That's going from the core, from the center, out. So the more out what you go, the more saturated the color becomes. So maybe look at the clothes you're, we you're wearing, your shirt or your pants. You can find the hue. Maybe blue jeans will be blue hue. My shirt is tricky because it's very gray, but yeah feels bluish, warmish. I don't know how it looks on the camera. And sorry about the light. I will improve that in the future. So hue first, find the hue of what you're wearing. Value, how light or dark is it? Is it middle gray or closer to black or closer to white? And then chroma. My shirt is very, very low chroma. Uh-oh. Looks like I just cut out, but looks like I'm back. Occasionally audio blips. Okay. Raphael, I see a message that you can't hear me. I trust it's back right now. So chroma, my shirt, very low chroma, close to the center of this 3D space. Let's take a look at each one again. So hue. This is the hue wheel, the color wheel in the Munsell system. And if you're nerdy, Munsell is great because it's very specific and it uses numbers. So you can actually find any color in 3D color space or just color space, let's say. You can find any color, identify any color with a specific number, a specific code. And people who know the system can talk about colors and know exactly what they mean. Here's the 3D color space. And an interesting thing about that is that it's not symmetrical. It's not a sphere. Like you might have assumed that if you take all colors and you arrange them in brightness in value, light to dark, in hue going around the circle and in chroma intensity going from the core, which is neutral gray outwards to more and more intense, you might assume that it's a ball be nice everything is balls in the universe planets right but color space has this odd asymmetric shape because the highest chroma yellows are at a lighter value than the highest chroma blues for example there is a gigantic book of the Munsell color system which costs somewhere around a thousand dollars i think or more and it's not necessary that you buy this book. There's a small version, which might be around $30, $40, which has pages for each hue. So this is the yellow hue. And you can see it goes from the bottom to the top in value, then from the center to the right in chroma, in intensity. The hue itself stays the same on each page. So this is probably five yellow which means the pure yellow and you can see all the hues and all the chromas you can get with that sorry all the values and all the chromas you can get with that hue and some colors are just not possible like a super high chroma high saturated but very very dark yellow does not exist i don't know if we can just not perceive it or if it physically doesn't exist but 
I would think with the wavelengths, it physically doesn't exist. It shifts to a different hue or just there's not enough light to propagate the color. Anyway, we're getting too deep. <laughs> Next, if we take one of those hues, let's go to 5R, which means the pure red. And then look at the value of this. You can see top to bottom, same value or the value changes. And then each row is a different value. The numbers in the Monsa system for value are the number followed by a slash, forward slash. So whenever you see five slash, it means value number five. I noticed the chat occasionally. There was a question, what's the difference between saturation and chroma? Same thing. Chroma, saturation, intensity, they're all the same. At least for our purposes. I'm sure you can do like nitty gritty, but yeah, for, for all practical intents and purposes, you can treat them as synonyms. So here's the numbers for the value. And let's say value five, which would be in the middle here. All of these colors are five R, so pure red, all the same hue, all as at value number five, but the chroma increases as we go to the right. So what happens in oil paint very often is you're mixing two paints, trying to get to a certain color. Maybe you need to, uh, well, let me say it differently. When you try to get to a certain color, usually you're changing not just one dimension, but two. That's where confusion happens <laughs> or a mess happens, muddy color happens, because we're not aware of what we're actually doing but there's only three things you can be doing. You can change the hue, the value, or the chroma. Super simple. It takes some practice to get used to think this way, but once you do, it gives you a lot of confidence to mix any color that you want. Of course, in oil paint, then there's the limitation of the pigment itself. So some colors you cannot get with certain pigments because they're usually not high chroma enough. So in terms of numbers or code, this is not super important. I'm just telling you so you know about it. It's forward slash and then the number. So whenever you see a number like this, you know it refers to the chroma, to the intensity, the saturation. So 18 here is the max. Zero is a neutral gray. So that's the center column on the 3D model. By the way, this is gonna be about an hour if I can manage, if I can keep track of time. We're 15 minutes in. So that color that I'm highlighting there, can you find the code? If we were in a classroom, I would ask for people to call out. Uh, I guess you can type in the chat, like how would you label this color if we go hue first, then value, then chroma? The hue is up here on the top right, value, chroma you can get the month's old book on Amazon I think I'm not 100% sure about the price it's been a few years since I've looked that up there's also a little bit of delay between my stream and the chat I think so I trust you are getting that and have a number so I'll move forward the hue is 5R, value is 5 forward slash, chroma is slash 18. So this is the code for that specific super high chroma, value 5, pure red. Let's keep going. This is another page of the Monsal book. You can see the shape of the page. This hue, the highest chroma, is at value one, two, three, four, five, six, seven up here. Uh, the student book is the lower priced one. Yeah. This page, I'm not sure. Yeah, it could be the, although no, it doesn't have the binding. 
but the student book and the full book both have removable chips like this. So you can take the chip out and hold it up against something like a wall, like these examples. The Monsell system is used in product manufacturing, archaeology, construction, interior design. You probably know about the Pantone system. Monsell system is similar, but used more for manufacturing and, and archaeology, I think and painting. So some people take it pretty far. <laughs> and this on the right is actually pre-mixed colors according to the Monsell system. I'm not 100% sure of where I got this image. If someone knows, if someone recognizes the image, please put the, the name of the artist in the chat. There's a few people who are teaching Monsell system really well. Graydon Parrish is one of them and Paul Foxton Here's another. <laughs> it's really practical if you have the exact colors already pre-mixed and he stores them. This, this person, he or she stores the paints in syringes so they can just squirt them out onto the palette. No time wasted mixing the exact color you need. So the Monsell system gives you a sort of navigation system or a compass for when you're trying to find a certain color. And the, the, the path you're taking is always through hue, value, and chroma. This is a picture of Albert Munsell, who is the originator of this system. A short uh, deviation to temperature I think temperature is a useful concept in composition, but not so useful in talking about color and making color choices when you're working from observation, because the word temperature is imprecise. When you're telling me the skin tone on your painting is too warm, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean I should change the hue or the chroma? Usually it's, it's one of the two. So temperature, saying warmer or cooler, doesn't, it's not precise enough to make you changes to your actual mixture, mixture. But it can still be useful in composition to think of warmer colors and cooler colors and playing them against each other. In general, you can divide the color wheel into a warm half, reds, oranges, yellows, and a cool half, blues, purples, blue, greens, And with light, there's the system of Kelvin, which is a scientific method of describing, measuring how warm or cool a light source actually is. Uh, confusingly, maybe 5500 or 5500 Kelvin is neutral light, white light. Uh, this is measured in degrees, so 5500 degrees Kelvin is neutral light and as you increase the number 7,000 9,000 you get colder light and 3,000 1,000 as you go down you get warmer light so when you buy a light bulb you can actually see the temperature usually measured in Kelvin on the packaging of the light bulb all right let's get into skin tones there's a lot of stuff here a lot of information so I hope this is going to help you painting figures, portraits, all that good stuff in the future. I call this what to look for. And part of this you can use like a checklist. Again, we're starting with this hue value chroma idea. It's just a useful framework to have in your mind as you look at skin tones. Here's a painting by Bouguereau. And one of his strengths is very subtle control, very precise control of color and of value and of drawing and of other things too. And if you compare this painting to copies people have done, I got these from DeviantArt and there's a lot of good things happening here and on this one too. But you can see there's a difference. They feel too intense. It's like someone 
when you learn how to drive for the first time and you go on the highway and you change lanes and your car goes, whoa, crap, like you way oversteered. This is what happens a little bit here when the hues and the chromas are jumping too much. One of the thing, things that actually makes skin tones feel alive and feel believable is that change in hue and chroma. But if we overdo it, it doesn't work. It becomes garish. I call this color complexity and color harmony. And both things apply to hue and chroma. <laughs> As I listen to that, that sounds confusing. So let's take a look uh, more specifically. So first chroma, I'll pick out a few spots on the painting. That first one is pretty low chroma. It's an area on the arm that's in a dark half tone. It's turning away from the light. It's getting maybe amid light. It's pretty gray, surprisingly gr gray for a flesh tone actually. This point here has much more saturation, much more chroma. So we're traveling from left to right as the chroma increases. And then up here, shadow, maybe some subsurface scattering going on. I'll explain about that more in a few minutes. Here is the highest chroma. So if you compare those colors, I'm going to zoom in for a bit. They're all similar hues and they're definitely all skin tones, but the chroma changes a lot. So if you paint the whole figure with the same saturation, it's not going to work. It's not going to look beautiful or believable. So this is color complexity in chroma. Then let's take a look at hue. Up here, this feels more pinkish. And I'm going to zoom in because some of you are probably watching this on a mobile device. So maybe this helps to see better. So pretty pink, a little bit orangey. Then down here, getting more to the red purple. And in the shadow, even more to the purple. When I paint the swatches, you can see a bit more clearly. This is reddish, this is orangish, orangish, yellowish, and this is purplish. Granted, the chroma drops a lot here in the shadow. The, the less chroma you have, the more difficult it is to become, sorry, to identify the hue, right? If you have a high chroma color, super intense red, you know it's a red. But if you suck all the chroma intensity, saturation out of it, it becomes more and more difficult to tell whether that's a red or actually purple or actually orange. And that's part of your skill that you're developing as a painter to have more sensitivity of seeing, identifying hues and chroma and value for that matter. So com color complexity in the hue. Nice. Something you can do in your paintings starting today. Add more differences in hues, but make sure you keep it subtle. Here is Stephen Assail painting a head and he pushes that color complexity as far as you can, I think. And it's very successful, very interesting, very vibrant, very alive. You can see all the different hues, all the different chromas. And this is also where artistic decision making comes in. The model doesn't look like this, but I'm sure the artist is, is thinking about color and pushing, stretching how color can be used to tell a story or evoke an emotion, create an effect. And if you have hue, value, chroma in your mind, you have tools, three tools to stretch color. Craig Mullins, one of the fathers of digital painting. So this is painted in Photoshop, most likely. You can see a bit more like Bouguereau, very subtle hue shifts. It's more violet, purple here in the shadow. Then next to it, more orangey. In the lights, low saturation, low chroma. Then it gets higher chroma, low chroma. Beautiful. 
So add complexity, but don't overdo it because there's the other principle of color harmony. If I blur this image, you can see that the palette of the, of the painting is really harmonious. It works well together. Here are three more paintings. I blurred them out, <laughs> the sensitive parts, just in case YouTube has an, has an issue with it. I'm going to blur them also and see how each painting in itself creates a beautiful harmony. It's like a song, like a, a piece of music that all sings well together. There's nothing distracting. Even on the right, where there's many more hues and more intense colors, higher chroma, there's the green, there's the blue, there's the orange, red. It all works together. And that is because there's difference, or while there is difference, there is similarity. If you have too much difference, things break apart. A great way of thinking about this uh, similarity is gamut masking. I was very intimidated by this when I first heard about it um, from James Gurney through his blog, Gurney Journey, which I hope all of you know about. Um, he uses gamut masking for his illustrations. And you can see on the left here, there's a shape overlaid on the color palette and he's only allowing himself to use these hues or I should say these colors. So red with this triangle shape overlaid on the color wheel, reds, we can go all the way to very saturated reds. But on the yellow and green, we're limiting. The, the chroma is limited. We're not going all the way to full intensity neon green or yellow. We're staying at a grayish green, grayish yellow. And that decision right there creates an image that has harmony, that everything feels related. There's some pink and purples in there, but they're even lower saturation. See, they're very gray versions of those colors. If you had these illustrations here and you added a high saturation, let's say blue into them, they'll not look as beautiful as they do now. Or beautiful, well, <laughs> let's not get into that, that topic, but harmonious, uh, appealing, visual appeal. You can make a gamut mask through something like this, cutting it out of paper. And some, there's some Photoshop plugins like Coolerus that have gamut masks built into the color picker in Photoshop. Maybe some of you or one of you can put that into the chat. I know some of you are using Coolerus, the color picker. It's a paid plugin, but it's pretty nice. This gets into color schemes, which I don't have time to talk about today. Um, but this would be a complementary color scheme with two opposing colors, an accent and a dominant color. Again, you can see that restriction of the colors we are allowed to use creates the harmony in the final picture. Okay, <laughs> quick excursion there. Back to skin tones. This is the checklist I was referring to before. Skin checklist. There's four items. There's coloration, the surface or texture, the specularity, how shiny or matte the surface is, the skin is, and subsurface scattering or diffuse transmission as it's sometimes called too. And let's take a look at each one, starting with coloration. Mark, I see your chat message. I'm going to type it in. Not the link, but the name of the plugin, so you guys can look it up after. So coloration. There. We know that, or we know, I would suggest that all humans you're going to paint are in the orange hue spectrum. Unless you're painting avatar people, Navi, they're in a the blue spectrum. 
but I have never seen a human with green skin or blue skin or purple skin. We are all in the orange spectrum. Some of us are more red, some of us are more yellow, but it's always an orange. In terms of hue, that's soft. In terms of value and chroma, that varies between person and person. But there's also a limited range of where we find skin tones in the hue and in the value. Again, the 3D model of hue going around, value up and down, chroma from the core, which is neutral, to the outside, which is more saturated. There's an amazing project by Angelica Das, or yeah, I'm not gonna try French. <laughs> Angelica Das. The project is called Humanae. I don't know how to pronounce that either. Well, I'll type it in. Humanae. Latin for humans, I would assume. She took pictures of people and matched them not to Munsell in this case, but to Pantone colors. And she created a, a palette of skin tones. It is amazing. So you can see different values and different hues. In this case, they're mostly different values. So top, we have dark value, still an orange, still pretty high chroma. And then again, lighter value, lighter value, lighter value. You can see some are more yellowish, like on the left here. Some are more reddish, like on the right, but they're still in the orange spectrum. Here, very high saturation on this one. And then let's find a low saturation one. I guess she would be on the low chroma side. Just really, I think, insightful to look at, at these to get your brain to think about hue, value, chroma. That's all there is for, for color, like to identify the color. There's much more to color <laughs> than that, but if you're looking for identifying a color, then you can do everything you need with these three dimensions. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was Gandalf for a moment. <laughs> I guess not. Let's keep going. So here, left to right, you see the hue changing. I made, I, I got the image in the middle from the internet, or maybe it was the one on the right, and I pushed the saturation. So on the right, you can see in the color picker, we're going very high saturation. This is too much for a human, unless the human has been sunburned. In the middle, that's an average amount of saturation, which is pretty good, pretty natural for most humans. And then on the left, we are too gray. If you look like this, it's not a good thing. So don't paint your people like this. Give them some chroma, some saturation, but not too much. Let's talk about the color zones of the face. If you're doing portraiture, this is a useful shorthand. It's not always like this, but it will help you to look for variation in hue and chroma in your paintings and in your subjects. There's a tendency that the forehead is yellowish and also often lower chroma, lower saturation, because the skin is thinner, the skull is closer, there's less blood circulation there. So lower chroma, more yellow, usually. The cheeks and nose and sometimes eyes and often ears even tend to be more red, higher chroma, because there's more blood circulating in those areas. Lips would be included in this as well. And then the third one, the chin jaw area tends to be lower saturation, bluish or greenish, especially in men when there's a little bit of stubble that tends to lower the saturation. Okay, I hope you remember this. It's a very useful tool. I don't know if I can articulate this as well as I would like to, but when you're painting, the problem is often not knowing what to put into the painting. 
happens in drawing too like you get these empty areas in drawing where your lack of understanding of that part of the body means you don't know how to draw it what else to draw the more you know about anatomy the more you the more um, sensitive you are to value changes for example in drawing the more you'll see in the model which gives you information for what to put into your drawing so i think of this in a similar way if i have the color zones of the face in my mind when i draw a portrait of course the drawing meaning the proportions is the most important thing to get the likeness but then when it comes to color having this in my mind allows me to look for some of those higher chroma parts so if i see a higher chroma reddish area in the cheek i'll put it in maybe i'll even dial it up a little bit more in the painting to get more variety more interest more aliveness i hope that makes sense by the way i'm enjoying this <laughs> a lot i hope you too and i hope you're learning something so on the left you can see those color zones this is an actual painting it's not edited by uh, gilbert stewart yellow forehead low saturation pink red cheeks and nose can't see the ear in this case and then gray low saturation jaw muzzle area even the neck is super gray here on the sergeant painting on the right same very gray low saturation not so much yellowish but definitely low saturation on the forehead more pinkish slightly higher chroma on the cheeks and nose and then around the mouth and this is actually a really really useful trick and they had to do this when they had the painters of the past with limited pigments limited palette painting you can't get a super high chroma red so what you can do to make the lips appear more saturated is to paint the area around the lips a little bit grayer than you see them on the model and through the contrast through the normal red being in the being an island of, of red in an ocean of gray the red will appear more saturated so that's a useful thing to do as well it happens over here too next back to Stephen Assail he does it too forehead pretty low chroma yellowish influence pink cheeks and this jaw area looks more yellow than blue but up here around the lips we're getting a drop in chroma similar to the color zones of the face there's kind of color or high chroma zones on the body those tend to be ear nose lips nipples <laughs> elbows and joints in general so knees as well wrists the hands in general especially if there's an, ac an action in the pose like hands are moved so more blood flows through them and knees and you can see it's it's pretty intense it's pretty amazing how much saturation the artist got away with here it's really pushed but it totally works go back and remove all those arrows this is a very strong painting in my opinion I'm not distracted by the high chroma areas at all it more like gives life to this figure so keep that in mind joints face hands you can boost the chroma a little bit more Wow, we just did one, <laughs> three more to go. Surface and texture. We, how are we doing on time? About 20 minutes left, looks good. So surface and texture. This is more important in portraiture. And what I mean is wrinkles, like actually three-dimensional change in the bumpiness of the skin. And beginners often think of, of wrinkles as lines, as if you 
took a child and you take a marker and you draw a line on the face of the child. That's not how you should draw wing how you should draw wrinkles and also not how you should think of them. Think of them like you see them here. They are sculptural information, three-dimensional mountains and valleys. This is a seabrush model and I should look up the name of the artist. I don't have it here. My apologies. So often we go the other route. We smooth wrinkles out and in magazines, fashion magazines, lifestyle magazines, you get images like this, which I think are hideous because it doesn't look like a person anymore. It's over smoothed. So on the left, we have some suggestions of those sculptural, that sculptural information. On the right, it's just all being smoothed out, airbrushed out in Photoshop. Don't do that. You can flatter your sitter a little bit, but don't overdo it. Here, the eyelid is a good example too. It, we've lost all the anatomy. Maybe to someone who's not a skilled draftsman, painter, they don't notice or, or they, something feels strange, but they don't know what it is. They wouldn't be able to point it out. But a trained artist can see that something is seriously wrong with the anatomy of this eye. The eye socket information, the eyelid information is, is just not there anymore. So if you want to smooth things out, do so with caution, keep it subtle. And sometimes the wrinkles actually add a lot of personality, communicate a lot of the life that this person has lived. I think this is beautiful. There's a point I want to make about texture and where these wrinkles are visible mostly. So if you look, actually, no, let's go to the sphere first. Um, this will be, <laughs> let me just go ahead. So the texture is most visible in the dark half tones. Light half tones are over here where the surface is facing towards the light direction. And then the closer we get to the shadow, the more quickly the value changes and we hit this line here, which is the terminator or shadow line. And just before the terminator in the darkest half tones, that's where you see the shadow, sorry, the texture most clearly. So if you go back to the portrait, up here on the forehead or on this cheek, that's more center light, meaning light half tones. And the texture there is not that visible. And over here on the left, close to the terminator, close to the shadow line, the texture stands out much more. So kind of this region. I tried to demonstrate this with a paper towel roll. So you can see here, I'm holding the roll up to the light. Sorry, I'm touching the microphone. Um, let's say I need a prop. Let's use a phone as an example. If this is the paper towel roll, the light is coming straight down. The more I tilt it, the more, let's see, <laughs> this is tricky, it's also mirrored. The more I tilt it, the more you'll see texture on the surface. So let me do it here, tilt, tilt. You can start to see the texture picking up. You see a more distinction between white and the pattern. If I go back, that distinction disappears, almost. So tilt, tilt, tilt more, more texture, tilt more, even more texture. Now there's crazy contrast here and more and now we're just about to drop into shadow and now we're in shadow. Actually, I should have tilted a little bit more because there's still some light here. But you can see all of this is now in shadow and there's no texture anymore. It's all unified into shadow. And if I tilt back up, it's this region here where we get the most 
visible texture that corresponds on the sphere to this area. Next, specularity. How much reflection there is, specular reflection, from the oiliness of the skin. Here's an example from a 3D engine, uh, Cry engine, I think, where in the middle it's a mild specularity, so mild effect of the oil in the skin. You can see it's a little bit shiny here on the forehead, a little bit in the nose, over here on the lips. If you go on the right, that effect has been dialed up too much. It's overpowering. It looks like a wax person, not like a human. This is unlikely to happen to you when you paint in oils. What's more likely to happen to you is on the left, when there's no specular. And this skin looks also not that human because it's just kind of dead and flat. Um, this goes a bit beyond the scope of this class, but learn to distinguish the specular reflection from the diffuse reflection. Diffuse is the effect of light on form, modeling the roundness of the form. Specular is the highlight, the reflection of the light source. So we're aiming for something in the middle here, natural. This is a good example too. This has natural amount of amid, or sorry, of specular reflection. And if it's natural, if you get the right balance, it kind of disappears. That's the tricky part about it, because we're so used to seeing this done correctly in nature when we look at people, that when it works, it's, it's invisible. So it's really good to learn about it, uh, highlight it, sorry, <laughs> bad choice of words, <laughs> accentuate it so you can really identify it, understand it better, and then you can control it. You can see it. If you know what to look for, you'll see it. If you don't know what to look for, you might miss it. Here's another example, matte surface on the left, no specular at all. And then on the right, we have with specular. And I should call out when I'm using images that are not mine. Uh, Obama is not my work. It's Sarkhan Hamidov. And this image too is from the Cry Engine um, technical manual. Otherwise, all images are, are mine, so this one I made. I just want to make sure I'm giving credit to people who put in the work. Like these. I don't know where I got them from, and I should make my own. But as an example, less oily skin on the left. It's very appetizing, isn't it? <laughs> and more oily skin on the right. Know the difference and know how much you want to dial it up or down on your painting or drawing. Specular applies to drawing as well. And we're at the last one already, subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering or diffuse transmission is when light goes through skin and kind of lights it up, increases the saturation. It happens in ears a lot, but also in noses, lips, on the cheek sometimes. And here's a quick explanation of different materials. There are opaque materials where the light is coming in and then bouncing back. There are translucent materials when, oh sorry, transparent first. The transparent materials where the light just passes through them. So this would be the glass of a window, for example, transparent. And then translucent materials where light comes in, bounces around inside the material and comes back out. So this would be maybe the milk <laughs> in a glass or a snail. This color here, what's happening over here, that's subsurface scattering. The chroma goes up, the intensity of the color goes up and the value goes up too. If you do it right, this is a huge, um, what's the word, enlivener, like it makes your image 
much feel much more alive when you put in subsurface scattering so light coming in some of that light coming or bouncing back the other light is going into the material bounces around and picks up the color that's inside of the material and then comes back out so the rays that come out again carry that color that's in the material and with flesh what's in the material is blood so the light is coming actually through your skin collects the red color of the blood and comes back out that's what you see here on the fingers so going through the skin into the flesh and coming back out and this these layers the epidermis and the dermis is where we have a lot of blood circulation that's where the red color comes from jello yes perfect so here's again an image from the cry engine 3d engine video game engine that's trying to simulate reality and this will be most clear if you focus on the ear so look at this ear on the left it's totally gray there is no subsurface scattering then there's a bit more and then here even more so this is too much especially in the nose i guess you can see when you have too much subsurface scattering in a 3d program things become too blurry too soft kind of artificial looking again more like wax than skin so what you're aiming for is something in the middle this is pretty subtle but i hope you can see a difference especially between the left and the right images here's an image without subsurface scattering and then with look at the ears look at the nose nostril on the right side and even inside the eyes a little bit and that's an Im important point in the eyes whenever you have dark lines i see this a lot i see students and other artists doing this a lot we will look for the value and we'll see there's a dark value and this digital human doesn't even have eyelashes so it's a bit creepy but you can see that line between the upper lid and the lower lid and it's very tempting to paint that line in a very dark color and probably a color that's too gray so in the eyes ears nose mouth i always shift my color a little bit more red and more high saturation i actually push it i try to see how much saturation can i get away with if i go to the next image you can see it's not only higher saturation but also lighter so be very careful with having dark low chroma areas brush strokes in your faces and bodies push the chroma a bit also in the ears you can see it really well sorry in here too gray too low chroma with subsurface scattering all the in chroma saturation goes up on the left ear before and after another example before and after again ear nose eyes we're all getting a chroma boost this stream will be visible afterwards so far i think it's gone fairly well for the first one yes and thanks nico for asking here's a painting by sergeant again from like looking at the whole painting like this we can't really tell but when we zoom into this girl and zoom in a bit more check it out look at that nose look at that ear so much chroma i would be a little bit hesitant to put that much chroma in my painting but it totally works especially when you zoom out when you have a painting this size you want those people in the painting to feel alive and a reliable way to do that is to add saturation and again color zones of the face grayish yellowish forehead 
pink cheeks. It's subtle, but I hope you can start seeing that. Right, the cheek is much more pink than the forehead. And then some gray spots around the mouth to pop the chroma of the lips. A lot of hue variation, a lot of chroma variation. So that's the color complexity I talked about in the beginning, but also overall, a lot of color harmony. Definitely the, the idea of a gamut mask is at work here. There's no super annoying high chroma colors breaking the harmony. I want to shout out to Scott Waddell for a second. He has a really amazing video on YouTube. Uh, you can write that down or open another tab to watch later. Really well done. How to model, how to paint actually form on skin, on flesh. And he talks a bit about diffuse transmission, if I remember correctly. If it's not in this video, it will be in another one. But excellent teaching, in my opinion. Look for Scott Waddell, Webisode 6, and you'll find that. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, we're almost at the end of the time but let me talk about broken color for a second. It's the idea of impressionistic color and optical mixing. So when you look up close at a painting like this, there are dots of different hues all over the painting. But when we step back or zoom out, the yellow and red dots are perceived by our brain as orange. You don't have to go to this extreme if you don't want to. The same works even if you layer brush strokes on top of each other, it creates a lot more interest and aliveness than painting those colors flat. This is Monet. These are close-ups from his water lilies painting in the Orangerie in Paris. Let me zoom out for a second. This is the whole painting. <laughs> Pretty crazy. If we zoom in, and even at this level, you can see the beautiful vibration of the lake, of the blue, because it's not blue painted like a wall painting with a roller, the same like dipping it into the bucket and painting blue, the blue you chose. These are layers of blues and purples, higher chroma, lower chroma, creating this layers of different colors, the color complexity. And then even individual brush strokes, this is so fascinating. It's a fractal principle it applies at a large scale and also at the miniature scale. Each brush stroke has, you can see it in here, higher chroma yellow, gray, higher chroma, lower chroma, by how the paint is applied. Over here, you see some green yellow showing through, some high chroma blue, then some dark gray, green, black <laughs> on top. This is good color. Chuck Close, playing with the same idea, changing hues and chromas. Meijun Chen, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. It's over here. Beautiful interpretation of the reference photograph. The photograph was taken by Ivan, Ivan Images on Flickr. So amazing photograph. And then compare the colors in the picture in the photograph to the colors in the painting over here. What do we have? Color harmony and color complexity. Different hues, different chroma, subsurface scattering. Really well done. Nathan Fox, he's a master of color. A lot of broken color, meaning layered colors, creating color complexity while still having color harmony. These make me want to paint so much. <laughs> They're amazing. I want to talk about three ways you can practice getting better at color. 
Oh, this is one of mine that I'm working on at the moment um, before we get there. See, I'm playing with this layering of color, letting the brush strokes be a bit more loose. Um, not covering everything when I paint over an area, but letting it breathe. That's maybe a good way of thinking about it. Leave some air between the layers of color you put down. So the complexity can remain intact. Uh, right, <laughs> we're running a little bit later. This is a, a cast painting that I did in Florence 10 years ago. <laughs> Time flies. This was before redoing the background. So this background has the same hue and different values on it. So there's a gradient from the top right to the bottom left. Just the value goes down. There's a bit of glare on it too, but even without the glare, there's that value change in the background. But the next step was to add a broken color background. So here's the final painting. And I'll show you a version where I increase the contrast way, way up. So you can see what's actually going on in the background. See this vibration a little bit also inside the cast, different hues and different chromas. So in this case, we actually took the green background and split it into its two component hues. So green, you can get by yellow and blue. So I took blue colors and tried different intensities of chroma. So very gray blues and very intense blues. And all I had to do was try to match the value to the background. So this blue brushstroke was a failure but that's okay. You go and test and then you adjust your mixture. This value is way too light. But this brushstroke up here, it's actually the complementary color, which was the next thing we added to break it up even more. It's a red, it's a high chroma red, but at the exactly or as close as I could, same value as the green background. So then when you step back, that red brushstroke disappears and what you get is a nice, beautiful, amazing <laughs> vibration of color. Here's some more tests of brush strokes. The values are wrong on all of these, but that's the idea. Paint green, not by painting green, but paint green by painting blue and yellow and vary the hue, sorry, vary the chroma. Vary the chroma and match the value. So again, final painting and then emphasizing saturation so you can see the differences. Let's talk about practice because all of this doesn't mean anything unless you actually play with it. I have three, three suggestions. Let me actually zoom in here. So you can read the titles here. First practice is color matching. Second is broken color study. Third is play the color method game. It's an online game. Color matching, and I'll try to wrap up here in a few minutes. Take an image where you can see the colors pretty clearly. Uh, here we go. You can do this digitally or traditionally, as you prefer. And the idea is to mix a color, let's say for the sky here, I'm gonna mix that sky color. So on your palette, either that's a physical palette where you're mixing pigments or a digital color picker. I'm gonna try to pick exactly that blue and let me actually make a brush stroke of a different color so you know what I'm talking about up here where I place that brush stroke I want to color pick the correct color of the sky so I know hue and I always go in this order hue value chroma hue first it's a blue that's slightly greenish 
then value wise it's not dark it's pretty light but if you go too light we'll get too much contrast actually let me place that down so we see what it looks like not too bad but it's too bright in value and too saturated so you can lower this lower the chroma by going to the left and lower the value by going down if this was physical paint you would add probably a little bit of black or a mixture of black and white to lower the chroma and lower the value at the same time then paint again and voila nailed it pretty much if you squint it should disappear there is a gradient in this background so it depends a little bit of where we place that brush stroke exactly it's up here now there maybe even a little bit grayer would be better so let's go on the left paint again yeah the gradient is messing me up a bit but let's call that the color maybe in next one just one more example in the mountain here I'll paint a random color first so you see what I'm looking at that's a purple so I'll go over here it's very low chroma so my chroma is probably about good over here but the value is too light now I'll paint it just so you can see it well actually not that far off but yes should be darker and should be even grayer yeah pretty close with practice you can get the skill to in one or two mixtures get the exact color you're looking for it's such a superpower as a painter so that's the first exercise i recommend you do just to practice this second one broken color study uh, actually let's just go here paint something from life or paint another like a copy of a painting and practice this layering, this breaking up of colors. Just put your attention on that and purposefully create the vibration of different hues and different values, different chromas next to each other, while maintaining the unity. And third, and I will leave you with this, is the color method game you can go to this link let me put it into the chat uh, and maybe in the future i should ask one of you oh see i made a typo so maybe one of you can put it into the chat correctly and that's a pretty stressful <laughs> especially the first few times but fun and I think pretty potent way, effective way to train your eyes to be more perceptive to hue value chroma. And I guess I should take questions and I should mention that tomorrow we're launching the shading course. You can find it at theshadingcourse.com. It's a course that helps you make magic by understanding light and form. So I go the same way I taught today about color. I teach about shading, how light works, how to create the illusion of three dimensions in your drawings and paintings. And yeah, there are two ways to study. <laughs> One way is to get a subscription. So you have full access to the whole course, to all the assignments and to the learning community. So you can post your images and get feedback from other people going through the course. The second way is with coaching so once a week every saturday we will meet and people in the course can ask questions and get feedback from me directly on their works and we begin tomorrow so i would love to see some of you there with me and with that let's take a few minutes for questions about what i talked about today anything you would like me to answer And if, if you don't have questions, you're free to go. This is the end officially of the class. Thank you so much for sticking around.
Any questions? Elker says, I find it quite difficult to achieve the same effect in digital painting because of how much control you have in this medium. The same effect, you mean the broken color? Hey, Virginie, good to see you. Bernhard, <laughs> so cool. Hank, thank you guys for coming. Tajamul, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, I will be sharing this on my channel, which I guess this is kind of the inauguration of my channel. <laughs> so thank you for being here. I will, I would like to do more of these. Gracias, Juan. Akshita. Mark. What time tomorrow? Yeah, we start, we do it on five at five. So same time, but just Saturdays. And let me put the link there in the chat for the shading course. ¿Por qué no haces un tutorial en español? ¿Por qué no hablo español muy bien? I think someone else should translate for me. But maybe one day I will try. And there was a question, but it's fading away. Uh, right, Nico, can you use Munsell chart as your palette? Uh, because it's all three dimensions, hue, value, and chroma, you would need a three-dimensional palette which there is, what is it called? Coloro. I might have to use my other browser here. Because you need an account, I think. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, it's not really a palette, but it's a visualization of, of the Monsell space. Other than that, I would say you have the Monsell system as your palette in Photoshop. It's right here. It's your colored palette. You have hue, hue on the right, value up and down, and chroma left to right. You have all the colors there. In Photoshop, there's also different ways of showing the color picker. So if you go to HSB, that's hue, saturation, brightness, AKA hue, chroma, value. So here you go, hue, chroma, value. Um, yeah, I think I can't log in here, but these guys have a 3D visualization of the Munsell space. Let's see if it's there. No. I think you have to sign up for an account, but then you'll see it. Oh, sorry, you can't see my screen here. Right, <laughs> the last few minutes I was talking in Photoshop. You couldn't see my Photoshop. That's it, newbie at work. So coloro.com if you want a 3D version of color space. <laughs> okay guys i think we're gonna wrap it up we've already gone 20 minutes late thank you so much for coming and stay safe i am usually pretty laid back about stuff like this like the coronavirus but from what i've been reading i think it's better safe 
better to be safe than sorry. So I had a birthday party tomorrow, but I canceled it because it's not worth the risk, you know? So I would encourage you to stay at home and not join group events until we know more. Just the thing you can lose there is missing out on some social events. But the thing you can lose if you infect other people is they might die. So yeah, let's be cautious. Sorry about the serious note at the end. Uh, check out the shading course, sign up. I would love to have you there. And thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.